And so to tonight's speaker, very happy to introduce Joe Banks, who will talk on From Ted's to Goss. Thank you. Awesome. All right, we're going to dive into this, I guess. So tonight we're diving into the wild, rebellious world of UK youth subcultures. Think teddy boys, mods, rockers, skinheads, punks, and finally goths. Each one was a reaction to the world around them and laid the foundation for the next. Of course, it's important to recognize that there are numerous subcultures, but due to time, we have to be selective. To be clear, this isn't a talk about the US or smaller niche groups. We're focusing on the major players formed in the UK, exploring how social and cultural shifts spark each new movement and tracing how youth culture evolved along the way. Well, journey from post-war period to the early 1980s, which stops at some of London's most iconic sites. This talk has been co-written by my father, Gordon. Why are you right there? Come on, Gordon. I still remember him telling me as a child, you know, there really wasn't such, such a thing as a teenager before the 1950s. Happy days. <laughs> <laughs> do you remember the world, too? I do, I do remember. That comment spurred my fascination with the subject, inspired by his own passion and my own journey uh, for self-identity <laughs> self -identity that I found to the Gothic tribes, if that's not obvious. <laughs> <laughs> there are, of course, other subcultures that emerged from post-war period up until today. Perhaps the largest of these was the hippie movement, oh, yeah. which in some form still exists today. They sit as something of a backdrop, having emerged in the 60s, driven in large part by the opposition to the Vietnam War. However, as Ted Holmes illustrates in Street Style, good read, um, as well, and might notice many a club member actually in this book. It's true. Um, where was I? Ah, lost, and lost my place. Yes, there is a topic of such size. in Vietnam. Thank you. This is a topic of such size and scale that require quite a few talks to begin to unravel the myriad of different youth movements, styles, and influences woven throughout the early days of youth culture. So tonight, we're focusing on giving you just a flavour, with a hope of sparking further discussions. It's been amazing to see how many of you have already started these conversations through my post on Facebook. And I'd like to take this moment to thank each and every one of you for sharing your photos. 103 comments, guys. 103 comments, look at that. And now to add a bit of fun, my father will be getting involved and he'll be playing a minute of, a, of an iconic song from each subculture. We want to see whether you guys can guess what the artist is, what the song is, and what subgenre uh, sub we're going to be talking about. But we'll come to that in just a moment. So, before all that, let's set the scene. The 1940s were a time of transition. World War II had just ended, and young people were left with a world they wanted to reshape. For years, the norm was to leave school at 14, go straight to work, and essentially bypass any sort of youth phase. You're a child, then you're an adult, no questions asked. By the late 1940s, a significant cultural shift began to emerge, driven by post-war American marketeers seeking to define and appeal to a new age group, spanning 13 to 19. This initiative aimed to capitalize on the increasing disposable income of young people, who had more freedom to spend on leisure activities, fashion, and entertainment. Their term, teen ager, was simple but powerful way to market products specifically tailored for this demographic sparking a movement that would influence the entire world. The change was further accented by the 1944 Education Act, 
which raised the school leaving age first to 15 and later to 16. Introducing a new stage in life. Films like Rebel Without a Cause and The Wild One captured the rebellious spirit of this burgeoning identity, solidifying the notion of the teenager in popular media and reflecting the desires and frustrations of a generation eager to break free from traditional constraints. Given this new term, teenager, offered young people a platform to question traditional values and push against societal norms. Gordon himself remarked that he left school at 15 in 1966 with no formal qualifications. I know he doesn't look that old. The, expe the expectation at that time was that boys might find an apprenticeship, learning life skills from older men, while girls often took on casual work before settling down to marriage and homemaking. This was the path set by older generations, but many young people began to challenge these expectations, seeking to carve out their own identities, separate from the established norms. So these new teenagers had growing independence, a desire for change, and a platform from which to do it. And it was this that would be the spark to ignite the youth rebellion. But beyond being just a marketing category, teenager gave young people a distinct identity, separate from both children and adults. This new phase of life allowed for more freedom, experimentation, and self-expression. Teenagers had the time and space to look around, question the world, and push against the roles they were expected to fill. And out of this campaign for social identity, youth subcultures were born. Each one a direct response to the social, political, economical climate of its time. These groups would develop a strong, distinct identity, with each style and movement rebelling, dressing up and shocking the world, creating an almost tribal identities. Now I'm going to hand you over to Father for our first, um, so he's going to play you a, a short clip of a song. It's up to you guys to see if you can make, uh, if you can guess what we think the artist is, what we think the uh, song is, and what subculture we're going to talk about. Oh, we have sweeties for the winners. <laughs> <laughs> so here's the music, the first one. Of course. So let's start with the Teddy Boys. Emerging in the 1950s, they were young, brash, and decked out in Edwardian style suits, think drape jackets, drainpipe trousers, and slicked back hair, known as DA. Anyone know what that is? Thank you, indeed, Duck's ass. Sweet. 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 No, no, no. <laughs> uh, sporting, uh, sporting brothel creepers, later shortened to creepers. A thick soled shoe that became popular in the 1950s, originally worn by soldiers in Africa during World War II. They embraced a kind of gangster meets high fashion look. <laughs> One step ahead, father. Oh no, you're fine. Um, and they wanted, to, and they wanted to stand out. This was a time when Britain was still reeling from the war, and young people were tired of austerity and conforming to post-war norms. They were eager to break away from the past and embrace something new. Ignore the next highlight, father. Don't worry, it makes sense to him. The Teddy Boys were all about rock and roll. 
which brought a fresh beat to the nation in need of energy. But the Teds weren't just about music. They represented a break from the conservative ways of their parents. They hung out in places like the Two Eyes Coffee Bar, located on Old Compton Street in Soho. This coffee bar was famous for being one of the first venues to showcase rock and roll music in the UK. Many teddies frequented it to enjoy live music and hang out, and made statements not just with music, but with fashion. And yet, while they were the first major youth subculture that influenced, wouldn't last long. And in the late 1950s and early 60s, saw significant social changes in the UK, including economical growth and the rise of a more affluent middle class. Many young people were moving away from the working class identity that the Teds represented, seeking to align with the aspirations of a modern consumer-driven society. <clears throat> Back so, to you. Time for another song as we move into our next song. My generation. <laughs> Here's a bit of music to see where we go. Oh, 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 born from the economical boom that transformed post-war Britain. This period of prosperity gave rise to an affluent middle class, allowing young people access to disposable income that the parents had never known. With this newfound wealth, many working class youths embraced a polished, aspirational identity, distinct from the rough and ready styles of previous generations like the Teddy Boys. The mod style was sharply influenced by Italian and French fashion, with tailored suits, skinny ties, and a meticulous approach to appearance. Unlike motorbikes, which were more commonly associated with the rockers, scooters like Vespers, a bonus point, a bonus sweetie, father, you ready for this? Does anyone know what Vespa actually means? Who said was? There we go, right there. It does, indeed, <laughs> meaning wasp in Italian. <laughs> and lembrettas allowed mods to stay impeccably dressed. Their suits and slim trousers protected from dirt and grease. These scooters were often customised with an array of mirrors and chrome and became the hot mods hallmark. Their style wasn't limited to suits alone. To safeguard their expensive clothing, the Don Fishtail Parkers, a military surplus item, which quickly became another cultural signature. The mod's identity was further shaped by their music choices, particularly soul, R&B, and Motown, genres that reflected the love for modernity. Carnaby Street in Soho became their fashionable hub, a vibrant playground where they gathered flaunted their style and pushed boundaries in music and fashion. In essence, the mods were a product of an emerging middle class and post-war prosperity, a cultural movement that celebrated sophistication, urban style and modernity. Their lifestyle, grounded in aspiration and refinement, marked a powerful evolution in British youth culture and established the Mons as a unique counterpoint to the Rockers, capturing the spirit of an era defined by economic opportunity and self-expression. And now your favourite part, guys. Over to you, Father. You're going to prefer him to me now, aren't you? <laughs> 
Bell and Lagoose is down. Hang on. Give me a second. Yeah, I'm bow out. The wrong order. Enter the rockers. Leather jackets, greasy hair, and motorbikes. They were the opposite of the mods. Loud, rough, and proud of it. They embraced a working class look, bringing a gritty edge to the youth scene. They weren't interested in sharp suits or slick Italian styles. They wanted leather and speed. The rockers hung out places like the Ace Cafe on the North Circular Road where they started what became known as a 100 mile per hour club. The idea? You play a record on the jukebox, hop on your bike, race to a set location and back before the song finished. If you managed it, you were in. Tunner Boys as another name. Basically, you managed to ride your motorbike at over 100 miles per hour, thus doing a ton. While researching this talk, Gordon recently spoke to someone in their 70s who was a rocker and did a ton. And he said it was the scariest moment of his life as he found himself laid out on the petrol tank, the bike rattling away, wondering if it was even going to hold together. Mm -hmm. See, for the rockers, life was all about speed and rock and roll. They were the opposite of the mods. And it wasn't long before clashes started happening on the beaches of Brighton and Margate. They weren't, just, they weren't just fashion statements. They were the expressions of class and culture. When mods represented the middle class, rockers stayed true to their working class roots, showing just how divided youth culture could be. And as these rockers transitioned beyond their teenage years, they continued to embrace their loud, rebellious nature, influenced by films like Easy Rider. They sought the wild sense of freedom portrayed on screen and looked to join various motorcycle clubs. This bold brotherhood and camaraderie drew them to groups founded by American Vietnam veterans, most notably the Hells Angels and the Blue Angels MC. Let's see if you can get the right one this time, Father. Uh, no pressure, my friend. No pressure. We're all staring at you. Can't get the staff, can you, Blake? No, I can't. I can't. I only bring you twice. Second time to apologize. All right. Okay. There we go. Okay. I'm a subculture. I like subculture. Oh, really? There you go. That's strong. I remember all these people. So here we go. Desmond Dacker. Desmond Dacker. Here's the one. Scar, R&B. And who said the uh, Desmond Dacker uh, Israelite? Who said that? Like that tune, I'll that tune. I just don't know what he's going to choose. I think they're going to sax pistols or he's going to play new rows by the dad. What do you reckon, guys? What's the subculture? Well, skinheads. Well, it's 
Skinheads over here. The breakfast cereal. Skinheads. Skinheads. Who is that over there? Here, Joe. Hello. Thank you very much. He's a skinhead. Uh, that's, that's another one. Thank you very much. Come back to you. Thank you very much. Share the wealth. Yeah, come yeah. out. You see, at the start of the 1970s, economical hardships severely affected both middle class and working class youth, limiting their ability to invest in the fashionable suits and vespers that had previously defined the mod subculture. This downturn created a more level playing field as rising unemployment and financial instability impacted everyone. In this context, a new subculture emerged that embraced the working class pride of the rockers while incorporating the musical influences of the mods. This fusion was further enriched by Caribbean and Jamaican immigrants, resulting in a vibrant blend of styles and sounds that characterized the skinhead movement. Skinheads reflected a unique intersection of working class identity and multicultural influences, celebrating unity and camaraderie amidst prevailing economical challenges. Drawing from both mod music and the rougher aesthetic of the rockers, skinheads with their tight cut hair. Interestingly enough, skinheads does not mean they had their hair shaved, sometimes it was a buzz cut or something like that. They wore Doc Martin boots, known as bobber boots, mm. tightly cuffed jeans, and Den Sherman check shirts, and thin braces, proudly declaring their loyalty to their working class roots. Music played a pivotal role with ska, rocksteady, and reggae defining the scene. Gatherings in West Indian clubs, particularly in Brixton and Hackney, showcased a cultural mix and created a shared identity rich in pride. However, as discontent grew, it opened the door for extremist ideologies to infiltrate the movement. And certain factors began to co-opt its aesthetics, promoting diverse far-right views during those turbulent times. Sensationalist media heightened these divisions, painting skinheads as inherently violent, overshadowing their roots in multicultural unity and pride. The later rise of oi music, a grittier, working class version of punk rock inspired by ska and reggae, found a new voice among some skinheads. While it's em emphasized working class struggles, it's also attracted far-right elements, further eroding the public's perception of the movement. Clubs and pubs in Camden hosting oi bands became hotbeds for cultural friction. And despite this shift, the original spirit of the skinheads, a powerful blend of working class identity and Jamaican culture, remains significant in British youth subcultural history. As Roddy Marino, a prominent skinhead figure, stated, no true skinheads are racists. Without Jamaican culture, skinheads would not exist. It was their cultural mixed with British working class culture that made skinheads what it is. You see, this identity was founded on unity, pride and diversity. Unfortunately, though, many original skinheads sought to distance themselves from the radicalism and violence that had come to define the movement in the public eye. Over to you, Father. Hopefully you'll get this one.
Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. I'm crossing. You need to go over there. Sorry. There you go. Oh, you got it. 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 Oh, Pretty obvious one, right? Excellent. You see, as the 1970s progressed, young people grew increasingly disillusioned with a world of chaotic and unforgiving. The economy was in turmoil, unemployment was soaring, and a jaded generation was ready to scream loud. Enter punk, born from raw frustration and a desperate desire for change. The punks were angry, unapologetic, and fiercely independent, embodying a bold anti-establishment attitude that would soon take over the streets of London. The roots of punk as a subculture found an unlikely incubator in a small but influential shop on King's Road. Say that again. Sex. Sex. Who, who started that originally? Sex. Me. <laughs> you! <laughs> you need the sweet. You just wanted an opportunity to shout out sex very loudly in a room full of well dressed ladies and gentlemen, indeed. <laughs> Originally named Let It Rock, it catered to the teddy boys and rockers. However, its owners, designer Vivian Westwood, and. Thank you very much. Did yeah. everyone hear that? Sweet, sweet. Sweet, <laughs> sweet, sweet. An entrepreneur, as we heard there, uh, I will say a bit loud in case anyone missed it, Malcolm McLaren. Perfect. Sorry. Sven Garley. Oh, God, God. Empresario. Empresario Sven Garley. Shyster. What do you do? Crazy money. Bullshit artists. Yeah. They began featuring fetish-inspired clothing. Jordan. Soon, they merged their provo provocative wear into street style, with branding the shop with three bold, ten-foot pink letters, and as you've said, S-E-X, sex. More than a boutique, sex was a hub for rebellion, filled with bold, provocative clothing. They challenged traditional fashion, a McLaren, fresh from managing the New York Dolls, saw punk as the next wave of youthful defiance. And here he connected with a group of musicians who shared his vision for something loud and raw that stood in defiance to the candy-coated manufactured music of the time. From this, the Sex Pistols were born, with Johnny Rotten as their brash frontman. Punk fashion itself was rebellion incarnate. Ripped clothing, safety pins, and chains defined their look, reflecting the gritty noise of the turbulent surroundings. Their aesthetic spread through underground clubs in places like the Vortex and, and Wardour Street, and shops like Boy in Camden, where punk bands created a vibrant scene fueled by DIY ethos. They made their own clothes produced their own music, and crafted a lifestyle that was raw and defiant. The goal was to shock and provoke, standing as a bold symbol of youth rebellion. But this fierce movement was not without its contradictions. Punk's firmly anti-establishment roots eventually became its undoing. As the genre gained popularity, elements of punk began to seep into the mainstream, leading to accusations of selling out. Bands and fashion that once epitomised rebellion started conforming to commercial expectations. Comedies like The Young Ones and characters like his up Puke in The Dick Emery Show began parrying punk culture, signalling its ironic acceptance by the establishment. Kenny Everett. Kenny Everett. Yeah. 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 Sid Snot. Sid yeah. Snot, yeah. All in the best uh, possible taste. That, that's not Sid Snot. That's his own thing. Yeah. By the way, that part was written by Gordon. It's true. Oh, In, re <laughs> oh, the busty ghost. in response, a new generation looked for an identity that was generally their own. One that was raw, unfiltered, and authentically represented, re representative of their own frustrations. 
It was the search for something that would embody their voice, standing in stark contrast to the caricature that punk aesthetic had become. They began to look for something they would adopt to the mainstream, but yet was so bold it would never become popular. Have you got this one? That was a ghost of death. Pandora, Pandora. Okay, well, Pandora. Okay, yeah. Wow, that was pretty. Only over there, was it? Yeah, Joe Catch. That's enough. It was over here. There you go. Lost me now. I've got no idea. Yeah, it's quite special. Twelve-inch single. All right. Thank you, Pardon. Yes. All right. Well, is, that, is that in the middle there? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, 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 she needs a round of applause. Yeah, you should really be doing this. Um, I'm not standing in a room with somebody who curated an entire presentation. I've got from the VNA, am I? And about to deliver a talk. Sorry, right, you've got questions later. You'll enjoy that. Yeah. <laughs> What? That's, the, that's what this club's like! It's, it's uh, very worrying. Oh. Goss. Yes. You wait till the Dick Henry fan club turns up. Yeah. <laughs> oh, you are all for the oh, night yeah. tune. Of which I believe you're the champion. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Bella Goes is Dead, that was the song if you didn't catch that. By Bauhaus. You see? From Bauhaus to our house. Uh, other way around. Can <laughs> um, you talk about madness? Uh, as punk began to wane in the late 1970s, a new subculture emerged from its ashes, one marked by its darker introspective qualities. Post-punk, or as it later became known, goth. This scene embraced the haunting and theatrical. <laughs> this scene embraced the haunting and theatrical, and its members wore the affinity for the macabre and complex as a badge of identity. The term goth first took hold when Radio DJ was playing Bauhaus's track, Bela Lugosi's Dead, remarked that it sounded gothic, alluding to the Victorian horror and romanticism that would, become, that would come to shape goth music and style. The scene's birthplace was the Batcave, a London club that opened in 1981 and quickly became a hub for goths hosting bands like Specimen and attracting a crowd that wore black clothing, dramatic makeup and towering hairstyles. The Batcave embodied goth DIY spirit, reflecting the same anti-establishment ethos of punk, but taking it to a distinctly different direction. Unlike punk's loud, rebellious energy and vibrant fashion, goth embraced a melancholic aesthetic, adding layers of depth and artistry to their look. New romances also contributed to the goth scene, flair for dark glamour. The new romantics brought their sense of fashion, uh, of fantasy and elaborate dress. While the glam rock movement lent a, uh, lent a challenge to traditional masculinity, with its exaggerated makeup, theoretical, theatrical fashion and androgynous appeal. This foundation made goth a striking counterpoint to punk's brashness. Goth was bold, but for a muted palette of blacks and dark hues, rich textures and silhouettes that drew on history and fashion. Goth added a sense of dark elegance, blending Victorian aesthetics with fetish elements, creating a unique visual language that was both sophisticated and unsettling. Musically, goths gravitated towards atmospheric, haunting sounds from bands like Bauhaus, Susie and the Banshees, The Cure, and Joy Division, each offering emotional depth that diverged sharply from punk's aggression. The music explored themes of love, morality, and the supernatural, resonating with those seeking an emotional landscape that punk 
for all its raw power, didn't touch. For many, the Goth became a place of solace, a world where they could explore the darker facets of life in both aesthetics and philosophy. As the Goths evolved into the Gothic revival of the mid-90s and early 2000s, Goth found new expressions, growing darker and more refined. Bands like Him and Typo Negative, alongside filmmakers like Tim Burton, took the subculture into the mainstream, creating a goth aesthetic that was lush, cinematic, and almost operatic. As goth permeated media, its visual codes were picked up in cinema and fashion, leading to a wave of high street goth brands like Blue Banana to help new generations access and embrace the style. Unlike other subcultures, goth managed to survive and adapt by embracing new forms of media, evolving into a timeless identity that resonated across generations. Through its striking visuals, atmospheric music, and celebration of individuality, goth transformed from a niche subculture into a lasting, iconic identity that has continued to evolve without losing its roots. Now, I said we're going to come to the Goths, so sadly, we don't have time to delve into the incredible web of subcultures spanning into the 90s and noughties, or the rich history of subgenres and resurgences as each subculture continues to this day to influence those that follow. Let us remember that these subcultures are alive in one form or another, and for those who wish to dive deeper, I'd recommend Street Style by Ted Palmas. A great read. Very much so. I would lend it, but I'm halfway through it. <laughs> when I finished it, I'll lend it out to anybody who wants to borrow a copy. But it's on the side here. Come and have a look. Especially come see if you can find the lovely Pandora. She is in there. Um, so let's take a moment to reflect. Together we've explored the evolution of youth subcultures, from the flamboyant teddy boys to the introspective goths, and seen how each movement arose in response to the changing social and economical climate. The term teenager provided a platform of rebellion, and the ever-shifting world of the late 20th century created the perfect stage for challenge and defiance. The mods and rockers reflected reflected class divides. The punk movement expressed raw anger at the establishment, and the goths embraced darkness and complexity as a counterpoint to it all. <clears throat> it's worth noting that while movements like the mods and punks as youth subcultures may have diminished, many of these identities are still very much alive. True. Those adhering to these tribal aesthetics are typically a little bit older now. But a spirit remains. Indeed, Gordon remarks how he, how he takes great joy when visiting Cornwall to see in a cafe in a small village a regular group of mods, all in their 60s and 70s, but still donned with fishtail fur lined parkas riding their vespers. Tonight, we focus on but a handful of youth subculture movements that could have had their heyday for, that could only have their heyday for a limited time before young people transitioned into adult life and a new generation sought to form its own identity apart from those that came before. These subcultures not only shaped the youth culture of their time, but also laid the groundwork for a diverse range of identities that would follow. Their legacies remind us of the enduring power of youth to challenge norms and adapt to an ever-changing world. I hope this spirit continues as emerging generations pave the way for new expressions of individuality in the decades to come. And it goes without saying that this topic is incredibly expansive. Each subculture alone could fill an entire talk. My goal today was to inspire conversation. And to help facilitate that, I've invited my father, Gordon, who helped me shape this talk 
And as you've seen, give out uh, sweeties. Tell him an interesting story, he might give you a sweet. Um, <laughs> and also, my partner, Jabana. The three of us will be around afterwards, and we'd love to chat, debate, and dive deeper into anything we may have missed. Who knows? Maybe you'll bring up something new for us to explore. Yes, sir. This is all very interesting, <laughs> but where's the place for Tweed in the Norse? It's got it predates right? it predates the tags, and it's post nineteen eighty something. You know, I mean, that's why. Yeah, that's that's right. Yeah, it's, uh, really. Me? <laughs> Sorry, you're just winding up. You carry on. I uh, know, indeed. The thing is, though, as I said, it's when you only have a forty-five minute talk. I mean, you just have to look how thick this book is. You've only got to turn to the back page of this particular book to see all Ooh. the myriad of so different styles yeah. that are spanning that time. And let's not forget, each one of these had a resurgence. Mods had a resurgence. Oh, no, it's true. Yeah. Mods even had a resurgence. Yeah. Punks still have resurgences now. Those resurgences are always happening. But I know you guys will like the beer, and so I'm not going to stand here for three hours and talk you. Also, Johnny Rotten wears nothing but tweet nowadays, as far as I can tell. Ah, well, and advertising so advertising butter. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Something you did Twitter. It's like, when you see the earth, it's not the culture talks nuts. There's very few people who and that is because it's partly, um, because at that time, the men had, the boys had more economic power. The girls were still up to the 70s, were expected to give up their wages. They had a lot of power in the boys and girls. All their, all their wages for them to keep yes. going. Yeah. Whereas boys were allowed allowance or kept their so They had to run off that. The girls gave up the money. Um, and that's how it, that's what I'm going to touch on. The economic situations actually played a That's why the early cultures were more male. Say, yeah. Ugly culture as well. Because my girls didn't hang around with men like that. Yeah. Really, until Pandora's time, the Goths and punk, women didn't get a chance to be part of it. There were, yes, I mean, there were female teddies, um, there were, um, you know, it's called teddy boys, but there were female teddies, there were female mods and rockers as well um, who used to hang out with them. So they did exist, but you are absolutely yeah. right. It was not in nowhere near the same numbers uh, as it was before. And it's a really important point, so thank you, you very much for bringing it. Well, yeah. <laughs> and if your reputation still yeah. then until really the 70s and mm. the 80s, mm. you know, people still frown on friends of mine moving into it in the 80s and things like that. Absolutely. So, yeah. Thank you for bringing that up. Appreciate it. Yeah. yeah. Just going back to the skin, um, yeah. I don't recall, I mean, I was around at the time, I don't recall them um, in those, in that period, being infiltrated by the far right. I mean, they had their own reputation for violence. Yeah. Uh, that they became part of the football culture they formed. Mm -hmm. People would get, maybe they didn't know, but football, each football club had its own mm -hmm. gang yeah. who terrorised people on trains outside mm -hmm. football stadiums. And that, because they were, I know you said that, but they didn't have their skinheads, but they were yes. most of worst shaped. And wearing very much the style of skinheads. Yeah, and wearing you know, their whole pile of boots and everything else. But I mean, the, the other the subculture that went from that was uh, smoothies, where mm -hmm. they wore, I was sort of part of that in terms of they would wear some shirts, but they would wear stay breasts, um, robes, mm. and also the um, very, very. Yeah, not that, I think that was more skin heads, right? But they also wore the top coat, the crombie coat, yes. yeah. with the red. Yeah. They were yeah. more into red handkerchief, and they were more into um, uh, motor. Yeah, absolutely, you are right. Was, um, when it had a revival in 79, 88, 1, which one was one. That got infiltrated by what's your front of the sign that was very, uh, became very big. Yeah. That was the thing. I mean, it was, and then, yeah, it was, it was, it was the second generation, generation wasn't yeah. it? The, 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 the original skinheads went 
Yeah, there were nothing to do with this. Yeah, there were nothing to do with this. In the late 60s, early 70s? Early 70s. Early 70s. Early 70s. So we didn't train to have another one. Right, I, I was a young lad in my shorts and home conquers. When I left school in 79, I was very much into school culture. So I did it once I left school. Um, I think but it's just gave it up when the far right got to yeah, the And that's right. exactly what happened. And that's realistically what happened to skinheads. Um, it very much was a case of not all skinheads became violent. And that's not what we're saying. We're not saying those who were originally skinheads in the early 70s became violent and angry people. Yeah. No, they were not. The reason why skinheads started to drift away and those people who were non-violent skinheads stopped doing it was because people went, oh, you're dressing yeah. this way, you're a violent... Oh, oh, you're violent. Yeah, not. Right. Violence, but it wasn't the original skinheads did not. The original skinheads were uh, was just an embracement of the Jamaican and Caribbean cultures mixed with the working class element. Yeah, exactly. Um, and so the original skinheads were not violent at all. They believed in no more than your multi rockers or any young people these days like to get into a bit of a like to get a bit of a frack up. Uh, yeah, and it was a little bit later on that reputation, unfortunately, did come out. Fight, fight, fight! Virtually every place, every nightclub, cafe, shop, and every London. Yes. Why is that Because I deliberately chose in this talk to focus on London, as this is where we call our home. So that was the reason why. There are other places that we could talk about. Uh, unfortunately, I don't know of them, but I know that there are. The Manchester had a big one. Leicester had a huge goth scene um, as well, and a massive punk scene. Leicester had a huge punk scene, scene. scene. Um, as well. But um, just because we live in London, I thought it'd be really interesting that my hope was that maybe when you walk down Soho or something like that, you think, Oh, the mugs are walking down here. Yeah. Or, or you might go and see the Two Eyes Club, and that's why I put the plaque there. Because you may be walking around uh, around there and spot the Two Eyes Club, or the now the Vision Chip Shop as it is, and think, oh yeah, that was where that... It was, that was my hope. So he's just bringing it home. Yeah, yeah. But London is the centre of a lot of subcultures and where a lot of subcultures start and bleed out from. But you are right, there are some pretty big places across the UK as well. But I wanted to bring it back to London, if I could. It did. It still does. Absolutely does. I mean, you, 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 you're quite... With regards to the ones that you've done, you're quite right. I mean, it's... it's it, um, the, the comment about other subcultures emerging from other areas is absolutely also right as well. Yep. You know, Northern Seoul, by virtue of its very name, did sort of uh, uh, emanate from London, although it basically came from America, but it was a fact with people from the North, like this certain type of sort of uh, mm -hmm. obscure soul music. And uh, the casual movement of the late 70s, early 80s, all emanated from... Football team was going to watch uh, teams abroad in the late 70s and early 80s and bringing back the clothes that John McEnroe and Bjorn Borg wore and golfers wore, mm -hmm. you know, Pringles, Lyman Scott, Ticini, uh, Lacoste, uh, Fila and all that sort of hoo-ha. It was all aspirational. Yeah, it was. Once again, a bit like Mont. So you were basically, if, you, if one goes as far as casual in the sort of early 80s, post the mod revival and the skinhead revival, that was what a lot of that sort of hoo-ha turned into. You're right. But once again, it was all aspirational, and it's... Uh, um, I never thought goth was aspirational, Pandora. Let's listen to the experts on the subject. I mean, you know... I mean, it's goth, goth was more a sort of a, you know, cerebral as opposed to aspirational. Yes. Because they were more interested in the literature of the film as well behind the goth literature of the whole of the film was behind the scenes. It's just what one inspired me so it was out. So yeah. it wasn't so much one own or possessing of being a specific. There was a magazine called the Gothic Society, mm. um, which was written in about a couple of about 20 years ago. Um, it went out of publication, but it was brought out uh, monthly. It's it very uh, intense uh, in the 18th century, 19th century literature. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. But so, what, uh, what about those of us? Perhaps I'm I'm a club of one. 
whose teenage rebellion was not to rebel. Yeah, no. The, but yeah. I never found the bloody cafe, right? <laughs> <laughs> Believe it or not, <laughs> you're not. A, you'll be happy to know you're not a club of one. Gordon was in the same boat. Um, weren't you? I was a young fogey. Yeah. Um, and now I'm a bloody old fogey, aren't I? Let me end this, guys, because the reason I, I want to end this for two reasons. One, because well. We all want to have a drink. <laughs> the second reason why I want to finish this now is because you've all brought up some great points. Yeah? I'm only what age I am now, I'm not going to tell you. Um, <laughs> but I'm only so old. Okay? I wish. Um, yes. So there's still so much I can learn. There's still so much I can discover. And so I partially want to finish as well because you've got so much to tell me. I'm very anxious, very keen to hear what you all have to say to me. So let me end this with this final parting comment. Finally, it's worth remembering that rebellious youth with their shocks and challenges to society aren't a new phenomenon. As one adult once said, I see no hope for the future of our people if they are dependent on the frivolous youth of today. For certainly all youth are reckless beyond words. When I was young, we were, taught to, uh, we were taught to respect our elders. But the present youth are exceedingly disrespectful and impatient of restraint. Hesod, 8th century yeah. BC. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs>